This is the Disbeliever's Guide to Quantum Computing. Great claims are often made about the power of quantum computing. But how does a quantum computer work? We'll go through a simple example and get a flavour of what it's all about. Perhaps the simplest example is one that's commonly known as the Deutsch Oracle. It has been claimed that this shows how a quantum computer can theoretically outperform a classical computer. Like many of the tasks devised for quantum computers, the Deutsch Oracle is of little practical use. And the scenario sounds very obscure and very contrived, but it will serve a purpose if it demonstrates some basic operations of a quantum computer. And particularly if it demonstrates how a quantum algorithm can easily outperform a deterministic classical algorithm. It involves a black box that takes some binary values as inputs and produces either a zero or a one as output for each input combination. The task for the quantum computer is to determine if the black box function is constant or balanced. But what does it mean for a function to be constant or balanced? Well, if we've got a traditional logic gate with two binary inputs and one binary output, we know the gate is either an AND gate or an OR gate or any one of 16 possible gates. But we don't know which one it is. So the gate is effectively a black box. For the four different input combinations of 00, 0, 01, 10 0, and 11, 1, a constant function will either always return 0 or always return 1. Whereas a balanced function will return a 1 for half the input combinations and a 0 for the other half. So there will be two zeros and two ones in the output values of these balanced functions. In the Deutsch Oracle, we are told that our black box is either a constant or a balanced function, so we can ignore any unbalanced functions. Now let's simplify things even further and just have a single input to our black box. With just one input bit, we have four possible functions, two constant and two balanced. One function simply sets the output bit to zero. Another function just takes the input and outputs the same value. Then there's the NOT gate which flips the input bit. And the last function simply sets the output bit to one. Now, Computational performance is related to how many queries we need to do in order to determine if the function in the black box is constant or balanced. With classical bits, we need to do two queries. We need to try inputs of both 0 and 1 in order to determine if the black box function is constant or not. But with qubits instead of bits, an answer can apparently be obtained with just one query. Furthermore, no matter how many inputs there are to our black box, the quantum solution can be found in just one query. This is a type of decision problem, which is a problem that returns a yes or no result. And quantum computing is supposed to be good at solving optimization problems, because they can be implemented as repetitive calls to a decision problem. So now we need to get our heads around qubits. We can think of a qubit as being in any one of many possible states. The states and operations form a state machine on a unit circle or a unit sphere, otherwise known as a block sphere. In this example, we are only concerned with x and y values, so our state machine can be represented on a circle drawn on an x-y graph. The circle has a radius of 1 and is drawn around the origin. Then the coordinates of 8 evenly spaced points around the circle forms our unit circle finite state machine. We can now think of a qubit 
as being a circular disc with a single dot on its circumference corresponding to one of these eight positions. Regardless of which of these eight states the qubit is in, when we measure it, the state is said to collapse into a classical bit value of 0 or 1. Qubit states can be shown using Dirac vector notation, which shows the value of a vector between a bar and an angle bracket. If a qubit is in a state where the y coordinate is 0, then when measured it will produce a classical 0 binary value. And if a qubit is in a state where the y coordinate is 1 or minus 1, then when measured it will produce a classic 1 binary value. The other four states have plus or minus 1 over the square root of 2 as their x and y coordinates, and these are called superposition states. And there is an equal probability that these states will collapse to a 0 or a 1 when measured. It is also useful to know that we can initialize a qubit to a known state and we can use quantum logic gates to perform operations on qubits. And one of these quantum logic gates is called the Hadamard gate. If we only consider x and y values, then this gate effectively rotates our circular disk around a line that goes through the origin at an angle of 67 and a half degrees from vertical. So the state of the qubit will flip to the opposite state around this 67 and a half degrees axis. In quantum circuit notation, this gate is represented by a capital H in a box. This gate can be thought of as operating on the block sphere. But we're not going to consider states on the block sphere because it's much more involved and it's not required for this example. The Hadamard gate is said to put a qubit into superposition. Another two gates that we need to know about are the NOT gate and the controlled NOT gate. The Pauli X gate is the quantum equivalent of the NOT gate used in classical computing. It effectively flips to the opposite state on our unit circle, around a line that's 45 degrees right of vertical. And in quantum circuit notation it is represented by an X in a box. The controlled NOT gate does the same operation, but only if another qubit called the control qubit is at a state of 1. So now we'll consider the quantum black box circuit with just one input and one output. Like the classical case, there are four possible operations. Unlike the classical case, in quantum computing the functions should be reversible. So if we apply a constant function, such as set the output qubit to 0, then it would be nice to be able to apply a function called reverse constant 0 that would set its output qubit to be the same as the original input. But we can't do that if the original input is lost. Problem is solved by including an extra qubit that will be used to form the output thus preserving the input qubit. As a result, we have two qubits going into the black box and two coming out. Then using these two lines, we can construct the quantum circuit notation for the four possible functions, which are set the qubit to zero, set the qubit to one, do nothing to the qubit, and flip the qubit. And so one of these is inside the black box. By applying some NOT gates and some Hadamard gates, we can produce a circuit whereby the output qubit 
will be 1 if the black box contains a constant function and 0 if it contains a variable function. But in this example everything is 100% deterministic. And so there is no reason why we can't model or simulate this with classical computing using 3 bits to represent the 8 possible qubit states. Then the classical solution would have the same order of complexity as the quantum approach, making it equally as good. Not only that, but the quantum system will require several executions due to errors, whereas the classical system will work first time, making the classical system the easy winner. But what about the performance of algorithms that claim to make use of entanglement? Take Shor's algorithm for example, which is used for integer factorization. It is supposed to run in polynomial time, which means it should be fast, unless the error correction takes exponential time, which could make it slow and no better or possibly worse than a classical computer. The promised superiority of quantum computing remains unproven. If they could operate without succumbing to errors, then Shor's algorithm would be able to break the normal type of encryption used on the internet. But no existing hardware platform has been able to provide the error correction required for large-scale quantum computation. And if the error correction increases exponentially with the number of qubits, then the perceived advantages of Shor's algorithm will be unachievable. If superposition and entanglement were really happening, then we would struggle to simulate a quantum computer on a classical computer. This is because to simulate n entangled qubits, we would need 2 to the power n bits of memory in order to represent all possible combinations of the combined states. But so far, quantum computers have not been able to deliver the promised superfast times. It has been proposed that the error correction issue cannot be solved, making it impossible to demonstrate quantum supremacy. It has also been suggested that the existing noisy outcomes should be relatively easy to simulate on a classical computer. As the number of entangled qubits increases, the errors or noise increases exponentially, which is what we might expect if the errors were not errors at all, but were an inevitable part of a classical physics explanation. And so for a disbeliever, the evidence from quantum computing would appear to favour the viewpoint that superposition and spooky quantum entanglement are not really happening at all.